under fire. One. The vision. Mont Blanc, the dawn du midi, and the aiguille verte look across at the bloodless faces that show above the blankets along the gallery of the sanatorium. This roofed-in gallery of rustic woodwork on the first floor of the palatial hospital is isolated in space and overlooks the world. The blankets of fine wool, red, green, brown, or white, from which those wasted cheeks and shining eyes protrude, are quite still. No sound comes from the long couches except when someone coughs, or that of the pages of a book turned over at long and regular intervals, or the undertone of question and quiet answer between neighbours, or now and again the crescendo disturbance of a daring crow escaped to the balcony from those flocks that seemed threaded across the immense transparency like chaplets of black pearls. Silence is obligatory. Besides, the rich and high place to have come here from all the ends of the earth, smitten by the same evil, have lost the habit of talking. They have withdrawn into themselves to think of their life and of their death. A servant appears in the balcony, dressed in white and walking softly. She brings newspapers and hands them about. It's decided, says the first, to unfold his paper. War declared. Expected as the news is, its effect is almost dazing, for this audience feels that its portent is without measure or limit. These men of culture and intelligence, detached from the affairs of the world and almost from the world itself, whose faculties are deepened by suffering and meditation, as far remote from their fellow men as if they were already of the future, these men look deeply into the distance, towards the unknowable land of the living and the insane. Austria's act is a crime, says the Austrian. France must win, says the Englishman. I hope Germany will be beaten, says the German. They settle down again under the blankets and on the pillows, looking to heaven and the high peaks, but in spite of that vast purity, the silence is filled with the dire disclosure of a moment before. War. Some of the invalids break the silence and say the word again under their breath, reflecting that this is the greatest happening of the age, and perhaps of all ages. Even on the lucid landscape at which they gaze, the news casts something like a vague and sombre mirage. The tranquil expanses of the valley, adorned with soft and smooth pastures, and hamlets rosy as the rose, with the sable shadow stains of the majestic mountains and the black lace and white of pines and eternal snow become alive with the movements of men whose multitudes swarm in distinct masses. Attacks develop wave by wave across the fields and then stand still. Houses are eviscerated like human beings and towns like houses. Villages appear in crumpled whiteness as though fallen from heaven to earth, the very shape of the plain is changed by the frightful heaps of wounded and slain. Each country whose frontiers are consumed by carnage is seen tearing from its heart ever more warriors of full blood and force. One's eyes follow the flow of these living tributaries to the river of death. To north and south and west afar there are battles on every side. Turn where you will, there is war in every corner of that vastness. One of the pale-faced clairvoyants lifts himself on his elbow, reckons and numbers the fighters present and to come, thirty millions of soldiers. Another stammers, his eyes full of slaughter. Two armies at death grips. This is one great army committing suicide. It should not have been, says the deep and hollow voice of the first in the line, but another says, it is the French Revolution beginning again. Let thrones beware, says another's undertone. The third adds, Perhaps it is the last war of all. A silence follows, then some heads are shaken in dissent, whose faces have been blanched anew by the stale tragedy of sleepless night. Stop war. Stop war. Impossible. There is no cure for the world's disease. 
someone coughs, and then the vision is swallowed up in the huge sunlit peace of the lush meadows, in the rich colours of the glowing kind, the black forests, the green fields, and the blue distance, dies the reflection of the fire where the old world burns and breaks. Infinite silence engulfs the uproar of hate and pain from the dark swarmings of mankind. They who have spoken retire one by one within themselves, absorbed once more in their own mysterious melody. But when evening is ready to descend within the valley, a storm breaks over the mass of Mont Blanc. One may not go forth in such peril, for the last waves of the storm wind roll even to the great veranda, to that harbour where they have taken refuge, and these victims of a great internal wound encompass with their gaze the elemental convulsion. They watch how the explosions of thunder on the mountain upheave the level clouds like a stormy sea, how each one hurls a shaft of fire and a column of cloud together into the twilight, and they turn their wan and sunken faces to follow the flight of the eagles that wheel in the sky and look from their supreme height down through the wreathing mists, down to earth. Put an end to war, say the watchers. Forbid the storm. Cleanse from the passions of party and faction, liberated from prejudice and infatuation and the tyranny of tradition, these watchers on the threshold of another world are vaguely conscious of the simplicity of the present and the yawning possibilities of the future. The man at the end of the rank cries, I can see crawling things down there. Yes, as though they were alive. Some sort of plant, perhaps. Some kind of men. And there amid the baleful glimmers of the storm, below the dark disorder of the clouds that extend and unfurl over the earth like evil spirits, they seem to see a great livid plain unrolled, which to their seeing is made of mud and water, while figures appear and fast fix themselves to the surface of it, all blinded and borne down with filth, like the dreadful castaways of shipwreck. And it seems to them that these are soldiers. The streaming plain, seamed and seared with long parallel canals and scooped into waterholes, is an immensity, and these castaways who strive to exhume themselves from it are legion. But the thirty million slaves, hurled upon one another in the mud of war by guilt and error, uplift their human faces and reveal at last a burgeoning will. The future is in the hands of these slaves and it is clearly certain that the alliance to be cemented some day by those whose number and whose misery alike are infinite will transform the old world.